Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'll try to share some experiences and uh, some ideas about returning to sport to 20 in 2021. Um, I've kind of called this presentation the Pandemic Chronicles, just to, uh, again, give it a kind of a view as to where we have been and where we are as far as um, the COVID-19 pandemic and, and effects it's had on our events during the year. First of all, just to share some experiences from 2020. Um, I think it's important as we go forward to look at what we've learned and see if we can, can implement some of that as we go. Um, as you know, basically after the ski season ended in March, all IOF events ended up being canceled. Um, now the cancellations were done event by event, and I would say that we dealt with this quite proactively. Um, early discussions with organizers, uh, there were a few that were done at very short notice based upon changes that happened then, but that was a, a very few of them. Um, in most cases, and in, in fact, only one case is like the opposite, were cancels, cancellations carried out at the request of the organizer. In other words, it simply wasn't possible to do it. Um, for the European Mountain Bike Championships and the World Masters Mountain Bike Championships in Finland, um, it just turned out that the number of participating teams and athletes became too low to justify it having a championship status. Um, and in this case, the IOF actually said that it cannot have champ championship status. The event was actually held at as, as a WRE event in, in mountain bike orienteering for primarily Finnish participants afterwards. Uh, the main reason for that was that there were restrictions put in place very late, just two weeks before the event by the Finnish government that made it impossible to for, for teams to participate. Um, during the year, there were kind of three main reasons for cancellation. One was that um, travel restrictions either out of a country or into a country uh, or participation restrictions reduce the number of participants significantly. Um, local government canceled the event due to restrictions or they withdrew their support. Um, and the third thing, which is kind of a combination of those as well, is that there were financial reasons. In other words, um, could have been the lack of participation, lo loss of local support, um, and not the possibility to organize public events together with an elite event. So those were the main reasons why, why events were canceled. Um, we did have from the IOF a very good cooperation with organizers and athletes, and I think that we tried to make the best of a, of a difficult situation. All of the events were canceled under what I call force majeure, so in other words, no no costs were absorbed um, unnecessarily by the by the uh, organizers or the IOF. We didn't trade any any bills between us for these things, um, and we did try to consider athletes' planning, which, for example, resulted in the the fact that we will have sprint competitions at Walk 2021, um, which was a good cooperation between the athletes' commission, the IOF, and the organizers of Walk 2021 to make that happen. Um, Based upon this, the, the council had a discussion um, in the fall of 2020 about setting some new criteria for holding events. And one was that it's very clear that uh, the council had been getting messages from athletes and member federations that there was a strong desire to return to sport as soon as possible. Um, we had done a member survey, if you some of you may have seen in the spring of 2020, which had shown that members really didn't didn't think that it was proper to have major events and particularly world championships unless uh, most or the, the major portion of, of uh, members could participate. And we felt that due to that, there was probably a need to update that survey. Was that still the case? Did people still feel the same way when we had basically had a year without sport? Um, and should we revise those requirements? So council discussed and made a proposal in November of 2020 that was then consulted with members to lessen the participation requirements. So basically, for world championships, um, the requirement would be that four of the six top teams or six of the 10 top teams um, in the world would need to participate at a world championships for the world championships to go forward. Um, then the other thing was that for other events, no specific participation requirements would be needed. So uh, for Jaywalk Youth Championships and so on, there would be no specific number of participants from the IOF perspective that would be needed. Um, we also made a proposal from the council to lessen the, the preparation time 
um, that it, we should be able to decide six weeks in advance if the event can go forward. Um, however, for master's events, it was felt that three months was required um, just because it's individual participation, not team participation, um, and longer time for travel planning and so on that, that is needed for those events. Um, one of the other requirements that we felt was is that a viable COVID-19 protocol is put in place to make sure that we can hold it safely and securely for athletes, organizers, and officials. Um, and we'll get back to that uh, later um, in talking about COVID-19. Um, of course, it's always dependent upon agreement with the local authorities. Um, the a late change in the authorities is something that we cannot impact. <coughs> um, so the other thing we needed to do was not only consult with members, but also check that organizers were comfortable um, and could organize in accordance with the above criteria. So we did two things. We did a member consultation and we did a, an organizer consultation. Um, from the member consultation, this was carried out uh, in December 2020. Um, and the, the feedback that we got from, from members was that there was an overall a very strong support for the council criteria. So there was, a, again, a noticed strong, strong desire to return to sport as soon as possible. Um, and there was an understanding for the need to lessen the participation and the preparation time requirements that if we wanted to get back to having events, then um, not everyone would be able to participate and have the, the same time to prepare, but that was okay. Um, there were some, some comments and council approved this in, in the January meeting. Um, these have since been communicated. One is that, of course, we need to recognize that some countries may not be able to participate with full teams due to continued government restrictions. Um, for example, Australia and New Zealand clearly indicated that they will most likely participate only with Europe-based athletes at events in 2021 um, because their governments have, have really um, shut down even their possibilities to travel during um, more or less the full year 2021. Um, so that's something that organizers need to be aware of that, um, you know, don't expect major participation from Austria, Australia and New Zealand. Um, I think the same could be said for, for North America as well. Um, and those are things that, of course, um, we'll, we'll see probably a lower participation. Um, the other thing is, is that the, um, the qualification procedures that we have in place for events, of course, need to be suspended. One of them is the uh, the World Championships promotion and relegation principle for um, start places at the long distance event. Um, that that needs to be suspended until we're again back to full participation. Um, and the FUDO commission has been given a task of looking at those. Other discipline commissions have been looking at, are there other similar qualification criteria that we need to look at? Um, and we have seen, for example, the qualification for the World Games maybe is something that needs to be looked at. Um, there are some things about uh, starting positions in world ma in mountain bike championships that maybe need, 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 need to be looked at and so on. So there are some other things there and we're waiting for feedback from the um, discipline commissions about that. Um, the other thing, of course, is that this criteria that um, any participation at non-world championships events needs to be applied with some logic. Um, uh, and for example, there's no need to having an Oceania or North American championships if only one of the two nations that are in those regions uh, can participate. Um, that just is, is common sense. Um, the other thing that came back from members is that they ask that IOF, the IOF look at standardizing COVID-19 protocols as much as possible um, to agree on a, a common application of that. Um, and that we should communicate regularly with member federations and national teams to form kind of a handshake to make sure that they felt comfortable in participating in the events based upon what we were putting together, and uh, that we had a common goal and understanding. That was kind of the basis of the consultation and something that they felt strongly that we should continue with. So that's something that we're looking at as well. Um, we also then uh, consulted with organizers. And this was, of course, um, maybe a more... Uh, more difficult thing because having simple criteria is easy from an IOF perspective um, in one way, but for organizers, of course, can be much more difficult. Um, and the experience was that um, having the organizers on board is key to avoiding cancellation or at least 
can canceling in, in uh, well in advance if needed. Um, and so each organizer was consulted with a number of different questions about what do they see as a deadline? Are they okay with the six week criteria or do they need longer time? Um, what's the minimum level of participation that would be necessary to be able to have the event? Um, would you be able to have the event only for the event's target group? In other words, can we have the world championships only for the elite participants at the world championships? Um, in other words, not having public races or spectators presence. Um, can we have an event that has multiple, like a, um, a world championships and junior world championships at the same time and say ski or mountain bike? Can you have it only for one category uh, or the other? Um, do the um, have we already received a guarantee about the support of the local government, or are there some things that uh, may require uh, limit the ability to have the event based upon local requirements? We need to know about those early. Uh, and also, do organizers have concerns about um, COVID nineteen protocols, and what do we what can we identify in there? So, some general comments from the organizer consultation is that in fact six week notice was okay for most but not for all. Um, and some events require a decision further, and I would say in some cases even much further in advance. Um, so this is going to, from our standpoint, require still individual handling and agreements with each organizer. And, and we'll deal with that. Now, we, at least we know kind of the criteria of who needs to know things in advance. And we, we have some kind of agreed dates, if you will. Um, most events can be held without spectators and public races which I think is very important, um, that we know that we can keep these as, let's say, elite or as target group events. Um, financial support has been given in some cases from, from government or sponsors, um, but a few events are still dependent upon um, having public races or upon having spectators presence or on having um, still uh, promises of, of support. Um, the other thing, again, com as with the members, organizers also came back that it would be good to have some kind of standardized COVID-19 protocols and support from the IOF was desired in this area. Um, but the other thing, of course, there's still many unknowns, so there are no guarantees. Um, and just to, to give an idea of where we are now with, with events, I've looked then at um, kind of events and categorized them as to how do we view them. So uh, the first up event up for this year is the World Ski Orienteering Championships in Estonia which is also the Junior World Championships and the European Youth Championships. Um, we feel, if Mark this green, because we feel strongly now that it will go ahead. We had um, 16 uh, nations uh, signed up. All of the top teams are there, so it meets the participation requirements. Um, we've made the decision at the deadline already. It can be held without public events. There's local support. Um, and they have worked out a COVID-19 protocol, which we're we're working on together with them from the IOF. Um, and the only reason that there would be any concerns would be if there would be, say, an outbreak in the region one or two weeks before the event that would cause major changes. So we feel very comfortable about the, um, the World Ski Orienteering Championships going forward. Um, ones that I had marked in yellow, this is from a, a previous presentation, but um, and it's proven again in this case that the Ski Orienteering World Cup in Finland and the European Junior and Youth uh, Championships in Hungary have both had to be canceled. Um, the Ski World Cup, because there we got a no from the Regional Health Authority, um, and the European Junior and Youth for a number of reasons, but one of them is that um, we felt strongly there was a need to do testing for the partic participants to be able to participate. Um, and the, the organizer felt that it was possible to manage basic requirements, but not if testing was required. And I, um, it would not be possible to have the event without um, having COVID-19 testing in place. Um, I've listed the European trail O as, as yellow simply because the only thing that's remaining there, it looks quite good other than the fact that they do not yet have in place the guarantee of local support for the event. Um, the European Orienteering Championships and Orienteering World Cup in Switzerland is looking quite good. Um, we think that that event will go will go forward, and we're putting our, our efforts into that. Um, but the we are looking very closely at the COVID nineteen protocol for that event, since it is still quite early in the year. Um, the World Masters Mountain Bike Championships was canceled. I think that this is a natural to have a Masters event in May that early in the year. I think um, 
masters and and many of the, the the groups if you look at older age groups it just didn't make sense to have a masters event so that has actually been uh, canceled in advance the world mountain bike championships um will be making event uh, a decision earlier they needed 10 weeks to do that they also have kind of a, a minimum participation that's needed um we're, we're not there yet but um, i've marked it as yellow simply because there is a longer deadline the World Championships, uh, we're doing a lot of work together with the World Championships organizers, um, and uh, we, we, we're, we're feeling confident, but there are a lot of things to, to consider there. Um, we're looking very closely at the COVID-19 protocols. Um, Jaywalk and the World Trail Championships are listed as yellow um, for Jaywalk just because we have not had a complete answer from, from Turkey. Uh, we need to get that. We need to get a better idea as to what's actually going on. Uh, the Trello Championships, again, is primarily having to do with uh, local support, which is, is their issue. Um, I actually think that there's a very good chance of, of that event going forward. Uh, the North American Championships is, I would say, on the other hand, probably looking at a less probability. Um, they're looking at a very long deadline and a very high minimum participation. Um, and I, I, I think that there are some current concerns around that event. The World Masters Orienteering Championships, of course, a lot of this will be dependent upon where we are with vaccinations in the summer. Um, and also the main concern here is that uh, the minimum participation level is what we really need to look at at the first entry deadline around the 1st of May. Um, and the fact that we believe that Masters will be very late in entering for the event due to the fact that we just don't know about vaccinations and so on. But date-wise and so on, we're feeling that this should be okay. So um, my best guess at the moment would be 50-50 on the World Masters. Um, the Orienteering World Cup in Sweden, again, like the one in Switzerland, is looking very good. Uh, it can be held completely as an elite-only event. It's in a remote location in Sweden. We feel very uh, confident about that event going forward as it's also into the August timeframe. Uh, the European Mountain Bike Championships, we don't have a complete answer from them, so that's kind of a, um, a question mark. European Youth Championships in Lithuania, again, is looking very good, but they don't have a, yet a promise for local support. Um, the Orienteering World Cup in Italy, a uh, number of things that need to be confirmed there. So I have that as, as marked as, as yellow. They also want a slightly longer deadline. Um, the Mountain Bike World Cup in Portugal, and now also the World Masters Mountain Bike Championships, was moved to Portugal in October. We haven't actually asked them yet about the status of that event. So um, but it's, it's very late in the year. We would expect that um, it would be easier to have the event then, but we do need to get some, some more things straightened out with them. And then finally, the Asian Junior and Youth Championships in Hong Kong, which is the final event of the year, is looking good. So I think um, we feel conf very confident about the events that were listed as green. The ones that are yellow are ones that we need to, to work out details on. And then there have been some events that have been canceled. In summary, there still are many unknowns. Um, we will, we do have to expect that there will be further cancellations due to COVID-19. I do not think that all of the events will go forward for the year. We will have some more that, that get canceled. Um, and the other thing is that the progress of vaccinations and the effect of vaccinations is still very uncertain. Our medical experts tell us that there's really no knowledge yet about how effective vaccines will be. Um, in containing the spread and so on of the virus. So we, we need to wait until there's studies done until we have more data. Uh, and also whether vaccinations will progress in the very, um, I would say, aggressive way that governments have planned um, is also in doubt. Will, will we really have vaccinations of, all, of everyone or as early in the year as many um, governments are promising? Or are we going to have to wait until later in the year? That's still, still an unknown. Um, I will say that the IOF is prioritizing certain events as far as our focus. And obviously, the World Championships in, in FUDO, but also in all disciplines, are, we, we would like to work with organizers um, to make sure that we can organize the World Championships in all of our disciplines. Uh, we would also like the Orienteering World Cup events to, go for, to be able to be, to be organized. Uh, that includes the European Championships in Switzerland, in Sweden, and in um, Italy. Um, and then the next priorities would be on Jaywalk and the World Masters. Uh, and then the other events, of course, we will we'll help out and we'll, we'll do what we can. Um, but these are really, we, we do have a priority order as far as um, IOF resources and what we can, can help events. Um, and we're staying, we're trying to stay in very close contact with the ones at the, at least at the top of this list. 
a little bit about COVID-19 protocol for events. As again, due to the, the consultation that we had, um, we will provide some standardized uh, protocol assistance. We have engaged our medical expert team, um, led by Oli Heinonen, who's our medical expert in Finland. Um, he has received and, and got on board help from um, Katja Mjösun, who is not only um, involved in orienteering, but she's also um, the medical expert in, in IBU, the International Biathlon Union, um, and actually works as a medical expert also within the IOC. And she has been very helpful with this uh, already in, in helping us to evaluate what we need to do with, with COVID. So we, we've engaged an expert team to help us in, in looking at this. And we're right now in the process of developing template documents and guidelines. And the structure of that is that we're looking at kind of an overall instruction to, to all stakeholders and then some specific documents per event. And this is more templates that then need to be filled in by the event organizers, um, instructions to team and participants, instructions to media, procedures for testing, uh, maybe later in the year, what does vaccination mean? Uh, what's the status of that? Um, details of the events uh, and uh, what needs to happen as far as, you know, maps, local transport, all of the things that can be affected by COVID-19, ac accommodations and so on. Um, possible amendment, amendments to the competition are the things that need to change in the basic competition um, due to COVID-19 concerns, uh, different start orders, things like that. Um, Instruction for any IOF activities. For example, we have a president's conference and meetings planned at, in connection with WALK. Um, what will the plans and what are the instructions for that? Can we hold them and what will uh, will need to happen around those? Um, and then there will be a need for participants to, to declare in connection with the events and accreditation that they understand and follow the COVID-19 rules as well. Um, we have looked at what the International Biathlon Union has done, and they have been very successful in what they've done with COVID-19 so far. And also a little bit at FIS, who has both some, some good and some bad examples, and we've tried to look at learnings from there as well. As I said, we have also had help from the medical expert of, of IBU. Um, any COVID-19 protocols will always take into need to take into consideration health, local health authority requirements. And especially this is around... C and D above the testing and the status of vaccinations. Um, we cannot have our own standards. They need to be approved and they need to be worked out together with the, uh, the health authorities. We need to follow those uh, as far as they go. And also what the effects of a positive test is needs to be worked out together with the health authorities. Um, we are, as I said, we've, we've worked, um, the World Ski Orienteering Champs in 2021 has a protocol that's been reviewed by the, um, the local health authorities and by um, our medical expertise, uh, and we'll feed that expertise back into the IOF standards. Um, we also know that the Euro meeting uh, is being organized by the WAC 2021 organizers at the beginning of March, shortly after the World Ski Orienteering Championships in, um, in Estonia. And that should also be, they're also working on a similar protocol and that will also be something that we can look at as far as feeding back expertise from, from that as we go forward. Um, so we're putting some, effort, some extra effort right now on those protocols as we go forward. Some of the key issues to address in a, in a protocol are creating a bubble. What does that mean? Um, one of the things that we, we received information about from IBU was the, the bubble is also very much about the 10 to 14 days prior to the event. It's very important that participants, organizers, and so on start taking in consideration extreme social distancing, separating them from a lot of contacts and so on already 10 to 14 days prior to the event, as that means a lot for not testing positive when you show up at the event. Um, you need to look at the way that you deal with accommodations and services, minimizing contacts between teams and organizer groups. Uh, all of these things need to be worked out as far as kind of creating a, a bubble. Um, testing, and to say as well, the best case for all organizers should be that testing is going to be necessary for your event. Um, it needs to be agreed and approved by the local authorities, and we need to work out with them also what to do if there's a positive test, either uh, upon arrival at the event or also, if something happens during the event and someone gets sick, what do we what do we need to work out there? There needs to be some information in the in the protocol about basic hygiene rules, uh, things like social distancing, wearing of masks, you know, sanitation, and all of these things that regarding uh, basic hygiene rules 
And we'll be creating, again, templates for that. Again, what, what happens if someone gets sick? Um, and then there needs to be education of organizers and volunteer. One of the other things that, that's come out of um, both the, the, the member um, consultation we had, but also, again, in some of the, the feedback we've had from the IBU was that updated communications with participating national teams is extremely important. Um, and one of the things that we're looking at is, is that it would be important to have an, an online information and education center through something like Teams, as we're doing now, with team managers and athletes prior to the event, um, somewhere around, say, 14 days prior, to update them on the on what's going to be expected as far as protocols, how to create the bubble, how to um, what procedures will be in place at the event, and basically go through the guidelines for the event that's coming up so that they're, they're in that and we can, again, create this handshake with them so that we know that they'll show up and participate. Um, and then organizers need to think about having updated documentation available in Eventor and on the, the organi organization website um, so that we're, we're keeping up to date with those documents. The protocol may not be static. There need, they may need to be changes made to it as we progress. Um, and um, hopefully that means uh, lessening restrictions, but at the moment, it's actually about increasing some of the restrictions since we're really in the middle of the current wave of the pandemic. Um, and the other thing we, we would say is organizers need to already now think about having a dedicated person responsible for the COVID protocol issues. Um, if the person is not a medical professional, then you also need to make sure that you have access to a local medical profession um, in, in, your, in your organization so that you can have someone who can look at and I think this is particularly important in the case where you get sicknesses during the event that could be COVID or, or whatever, positive tests. You need to have someone on site that you can work out medical details with. Um, and again, th this person then should be in contact with the IOF medical expert, and we can manage that through the, through the IOF office. The other thing about COVID-19 is, is be prepared for changes. Um, again, as we know during 2020 and, and so far, this situation has been very fluid and there will probably be need to upgrade and to change things as we go along. Um, and at least in the first two quarters of 2021, um, the base case, I believe, again, again is in, accordance, in addition to having testing, that you need to have that in place. I think a base case is going to be that the event will need to be able to be held with no spectators and with no public races. Um, and you need to, as well to limit the number of persons on site as much as possible. Look not only at contacts between the organizers, but how can we also minimize the number of organizers that we need to have uh, for the organization of the event. Um, again, the other thing is what we don't yet know the effect of vaccinations will have on the requirements, and we can't plan for them yet. So we should not be at this point in time looking at um, changes or looking at vaccinations. And that's something that needs to be looked at later as we look at complementing test protocols later in the year. Um, as part of this kind of pandemic proto, uh, chronicles, I just like to say as well that the pandemic is, is not all bad um, for the IOF. And I think that there are some learnings from the past year that have been, have been good for us as well. Um, there are some good cases of increased visibility for orienteering and orienteers. Uh, I think during 2020, national championships had an increased importance. And in fact, one of the things I've followed in, say, social media and so on, is that many elite orienteers have actually perform, performed very well in alternative sports. And it has kind of raised the status of orienteering athletes. Um, a lot have done very quite well in athletics events. Some have sky running, for example, uh, where Tova Alexanderson and um, um, other athletes have done very well in, in other areas. Um, Recreational orienteering also has set records in many countries. The permanent courses, uh, things around that have, have really increased a lot and has given a lot of increased visibility that I think in the longer term can be very positive to orienteering. And we need to, to build upon that. Um, it's a year where we learn to go digital. Um, we were thrown in, in March, April into digital meetings. Um, I would say surprisingly well. I actually feel that digital meetings of council, for example, have become more efficient. Um, They've also become cheaper, uh, better sustainability for the organization. And they've actually also, for example, the General Assembly had record uh, attendance and I think a better um, uh, influence from the members on the General Assembly. The other thing is that e-orienteering has made great strides. Um, we now have a very viable e-Trailo platform that uh, we're now in the process of looking at how can we have an official 
like e-trail uh, world championships, virtual orienteering, lockdown orienteering, other things that have gone on during the year have been have really created um, a complement to to regular orienteering. Um, and again, we may not return to business as usual. Um, I think that what we've seen is a path to a more sustainable sport. I do believe that we'll have a discussion about a better balance between the national program and the international program. Uh, since national championships did get an increased importance, maybe we need to look at that um, also from a sustainability and travel perspective. Um, and I do believe that um, we have received kind of a higher appreciation for for our sport among ourselves, that we really want to get back to having orienteering and that this is important in our lives and things that we want to, to work on. Um, and I think that's, that's true for all of us. So that was the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening and uh, any questions and comments.